Well, it's good to be with you all this morning. We just finished up our verse-by-verse study in the book of Philippians. And before we move into the book of Colossians in two weeks, we're going to do a two-week series on the reliability of the Scriptures. The reliability of the Scriptures. Now, today we're going to tackle the subject of Old Testament reliability, and we're going to focus on the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now, many of us have heard about the Dead Sea Scrolls over the years, and that great find that occurred in the mid-20th century to really put the Bible on the map when it comes to its trustworthiness. Because the question we have to ask today is, did we have the reliable text that was actually penned by the author himself? Because the originals are gone. The originals have either been destroyed, lost to time, or whatever it might be. So what we rely on is copies. And if those copies are uh, not good, then we have to question how good is the transmission or the copying process that gives us our Bible today. Because the Bible that you hold in your hands today is based on the thousands of, tens of thousands of copies of both the Old and the New Testament that we have that stemmed from those originals. Now, these copies were distributed over the world, over in different geographical areas with different scribal groups doing the copying process. And the ultimate culmination of that were manuscripts like you see before you today rolled out. This manuscript was penned in the 15 and 1600s. It survived quite a bit. Um, The Reformation period, the World War I, World War II in Germany, and the Holocaust. And that's significant because it was penned in Germany by Ashkenazi scribes. Those are German-Jewish scribes who penned this. Eventually, after all those trials and tribulations, the scroll made its way to Holland for an update and a refresher and then on to Israel, where a wealthy American donor purchased it and donated it to Veritas International University. So we are the benefactors of the ability to touch and to feel the scriptures, and this before you today is a testimony to God's preservation of his word through the centuries, through all the, you know, toils and the ups and downs, through all the chaos and the wars and the tumults and natural disasters, God has preserved his word. And I'm sure we would not consider anything less from God, because if God inspired his word, wouldn't you think a good God would preserve his word for us. And indeed, he did. So today, you're going to leave here with a confidence knowing that what you're reading in your English Bibles today was penned thousands of years ago by the prophet Isaiah or by Moses or by Paul. So let's take a look at these Dead Sea Scrolls and why they matter and what they are. Now, notice William F. Albright. He was the great American archaeologist, and he was one of the first to dig over in Israel. He said, I repeat that in my opinion, you have made the greatest manuscript discovery of modern times. Certainly the greatest biblical manuscript find. What an incredible find. This was said in 1948, only a year after the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. Notice Matthew. He says, heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. In John 10, 35, when Jesus says, the scripture cannot be broken. Nothing can get rid of the scripture. The gates of hell will not destroy the scriptures nor the church. The scriptures will endure because as the psalmist said in Psalm 119, your word endures forever. Notice Hebrews 4.12. It tells you about the strength of the Word of God and the vitality of the Word. It says, For the Word of God is living and active, and make no mistake about it, living and active is the very attributes of God Himself. That His Word is infused with the very life of God Himself. See, when you read the Bible, it is the only book in history or in this world that ever was penned that actually reads you. It criticizes our heart. It is a discerner to the heart. Notice also it says it's sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing even the division of the soul and the spirit and the joints and the marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So the Bible is a book that can penetrate areas 
where self-help books or even common worldly advice cannot touch. It can touch and make distinctions that only God can make. And it can reach down into your life. It can reach into your soul, into your spirit, into your mind, and bring healing to that. And what a wonderful testimony that is in the Word of God. Now, regarding the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were actually discovered by accident. This accidental discovery occurred at Qumran in the limestone cliffs. And notice where that's located. It's on the northwest shores of the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is the lowest place on Earth, some 1,300 feet below sea level. But that's where these cache of Old Testament scrolls were stored and stashed. And notice Jordan lies to the east, Israel with Jerusalem just to the northwest of Qumran. And then you have Egypt down in the southwest there. But the Qumran area is a very arid and dry area. Many uh, monastic groups uh, go to settle out there. Uh, Herod built Masada, his hilltop fortress, there just a few miles down the road from Qumran. If you've ever been there, you know that it looks like moonscape. It is a very arid, dry wilderness with sharp, jagged limestone cliffs that provide ample areas to store and to hide and to keep safe the scrolls and the scriptures and all kinds of different valuables. That's exactly where these scrolls were found. Now, there at Qumran, across the wadi, looking right across from it, just within a stone's throw, is a cave complex. And the discovery of these scrolls were found, they call it Cave One, they were found by Bedouin youths that were searching for a lost goat. In fact, the Bedouin's name was Muhammad Adib, and the rest is history. They found jars that were sealed with caps on them, and as Muhammad threw that rock through the window of the cave and shattered one of the jars through the rock, he climbed over into the window, into the cave complex itself, and found a series of jars stuffed with scriptures and other items. It was the most monumental and significant find of all of the 20th century. Later, he would take these scriptures from that cave one complex and bring them back to his Bedouin tent. And ultimately, the people of the Bedouin tribe would take them and hang them on their tents, and some of them were even considering chopping them up into little pieces to sell them to the antiquities dealers to get maximum profits out of them. Well, thank God that didn't happen. Other Bedouins were thinking about cutting the leather scrolls up into new shoes. I mean, just think about it. It gives new meaning to walking in the Word, doesn't it? I mean, just like, you'd be like walking with Isaiah, you know, and Jeremiah. You're just walking in the Word. But thank God that didn't happen either. You know, they took him ultimately to this man here, Kondo. He was a Bethlehem antiquities dealer. And they brought seven scrolls to Kondo. And ultimately, a professor named E.L. Sukunuk at Hebrew University realized that Kondo had these manuscripts and wanted to go and take a look. And he actually did. He went and looked and saw that these manuscripts were something special, something unique, and ultimately secured several of the manuscripts. He didn't take all of them, but he bought four of them from Kondo and secured them for the nation of Israel. In 1949, the remaining scrolls were sold off to Mar Athanasius Samuel, who was of the Syrian Jacobite monastery of St. Mark in Jerusalem. And he had them and possessed them for some time because they were discovered in 1947. But by 1954, in fact, June 1st, 1954, Mar Athanasius Samuel went to America and took out a classified ad to sell the four remaining Dead Sea Scrolls. And if you look and you get an original copy of the paper, you have this ad appearing right next to to common household appliances and yard tools. <laughs> right in the middle was for sale four Dead Sea Scrolls for $250,000. Priceless for two fifty. dollars Well, Yagel Yadin, this man here you see in the picture, he is the son of E.L. Sukunik, who secured the first three scrolls from Kondo. 
And he heard about this ad, so he travels to America with D.S. Gotsman, who is a Jewish philanthropist who provided the funding to secure these scrolls and purchase the remaining scrolls for a quarter of a million dollars. Then Yadin took these scrolls, traveled back to, Amer- uh, to Israel, and put them alongside the first three scrolls that he secured from Kondo. So ultimately, Cave One's contents, all seven Dead Sea Scrolls, ended up in Israel in what you call the Shrine of the Book display. Now, some of you have perhaps been to Israel, and you've been to the Israeli Museum. And on the museum campus, there is this display that is a marvelously built specifically for the Dead Sea Scrolls to house the scrolls, the seven scrolls. In fact, you see the top or the building is built like the top of a cap of where the scrolls were found. So the jar on the left is a replica of the the jars that were made to house these Old Testament scrolls and the lid. And so the Israeli Museum took that design and made a whole complex out of the lid of the jar. And that's today where you can find these seven initial Dead Sea Scrolls. Um, Among them were all kinds of wonderful biblical and non-biblical texts. But before we get to the texts, notice that the place they were found, Qumran, right by the Dead Sea on the northwestern shores, was simply across from a cave complex that they found tens of thousands of scrolls. But it was this man, Pierre Roland DeVoe, a Dominican monk, who went to Qumran and excavated the city and unearthed the remains of what was left from a 2,000-year-old monastic community that was there. Through his study, he found there were multiple, what you call mikvot. They were ritual bath complexes there and all kinds of different buildings and grain silos and and water wells and so forth that could house about 250 to 300 people. Later, he discovered a scriptorium there that would house either the copying or the translating or the reading of the scripture. And in that scriptorium, they found all kinds of ink wells and ink pots and, and tables and chairs and so forth. But he concluded that the inhabitants of Qumran were the Essenes. Now, there is some debate as to who they were, but the Essenes seemed to be a monastic community that was fed up with the Jewish priestly system in Jerusalem, so they moved to the desert to create their own community. It doesn't seem like women were a part of this community, but they certainly had scriptures and different non-biblical texts that described how they lived. They were looking for the great battle, the battle between the sons of God, the sons of light, and the sons of darkness. And they were looking for a Messiah. And so they were searching the scriptures to help them understand what this Messiah would be like and how to discern him when he came. And various texts were discovered uh, through this excavation that will give us great overall information about these scrolls and what they can share with us. But what are the Dead Sea Scrolls specifically? Overall, the Dead Sea Scrolls were found in 11 caves in the Qumran area near the Dead Sea. 900 biblical and non-biblical texts in languages such as Hebrew, Aramaic, and even some in Greek. In fact, there are some who powerfully argue that some of the Greek texts in Cave 7 that they found were early fragments, early first century fragments of the Gospel of Mark. In fact, Professor Jose O'Callaghan of the University of Barcelona published a Spanish language article about why he believes these Greek little fragments about the size of a half a dollar actually refer to parts of the early chapters of the Gospel of Mark, especially Mark chapter 6. But all these different languages were found Notice that over 220 texts of the Hebrew Bible, except Esther, were found in the Dead Sea Scroll collection. The scrolls date from 250 BC to about 68 AD. Notice that 68 terminates right before the destruction of the temple by the Romans in 70 AD. 
Also, over 400 apocryphal and pseudepigraphal literature were found among these Dead Sea Scrolls. The apocrypha and pseudepigrapha were literally, pseudo means false, and pigrapha means writings. So these false writings were among the collection of biblical manuscripts that they found as well. The apocrypha, as you know, was written in between the Testaments. By 400 BC, Malachi finished the Bible, and by the first century, the, the New Testament started to be written. And you had this 400-year intertestamental period where the Apocrypha described many of the historical actions, events, works, and people that were involved during that time period in the Jewish nation. Among them were one significant event. It was the Maccabean Revolt against Antiochus Epiphanes, the Syrian king who desecrated the temple. And they took back that Jewish temple and they commemorated it with Hanukkah. And that's how Hanukkah was instituted. It was through this intertestamental period of taking back the Jewish temple from the Antiochus Epiphanes who desecrated by offering a swine uh, on the altar there. But notice also that there are over 200 texts pertaining to the Qumran sect themselves. So that's where we really learn about who was living at Qumran, who occupied those stone ruins, and it tells us much about their philosophy and their understanding of Scripture. We do know they loved Habakkuk. Uh, we know have Habakkuk all over the place in the ruins. Uh, they loved to study that, that book quite a bit. But not only was there ancient discoveries at Qumran, just recently, a few months ago, there were new discoveries. In fact, there were many fragments discovered of the minor prophets, including Zechariah and Nahum, and these fragments are over 2,000 years old. They were found in what you call the Cave of Horror. Now, the Cave of Horror is called such because of the different artifacts that were found in the cave, not only the fragments, but also uh, a mummy of a child that seemed to be some 10,000 years old, and a basket that was many thousands of years old as well. But also, the location of the cave is near Qumran in the limestone cliffs. They had to repel using mountain equipment from the top of the pinnacle of the hill down into the cave because there's no other way in. It was quite daring, but they finally made it in. They sifted all the dirt. They unturned all the rocks. They explored it completely. Then out comes these fragments of the minor prophets, one of which had Nahum chapter 1, verses 5 and 6. Notice what it says. The mountains quake because of him, and the hills melt. The earth heaves before him. The world and all who dwell therein who can stand before his wrath. Who can resist his fury? His anger pours out like fire and rocks are shattered because of him. But the more and more archaeologists excavate in the Middle East, the more and more every turn of that spade in the dust brings something that confirms the reliability and the trustworthiness of your Bible. And that's no different here at Qumran still. Now, what about the contents of Qumran? What about the cave complex? The 11 caves that housed the Dead Sea Scrolls manifested all kinds of great things. In fact, one of the greatest finds was in Cave 1, where the initial Bedouin found the cache of scrolls and jars. It was a complete book of Isaiah. Complete book of Isaiah. It was the largest and oldest complete book ever found in the history of excavation or of bibliology. Notice that there was a second book of Isaiah found, Isaiah B, which is an incomplete whole book of Isaiah. And then they found Habakkuk commentaries, various non-biblical books in Cave 1, such as the Thanksgiving scroll and the Manual of Discipline that described the, the Essene rituals and so forth there at the Qumran community. But then also you have fragments of Genesis and Leviticus, Deuteronomy, Judges, Samuel, Ezekiel, Psalms, Daniel, and especially in Daniel, where in chapter 2, it changes from Hebrew to Aramaic, and then back to Hebrew in chapter 8. It is interesting, scholars thought that was the case, but never could prove it until they found this cachet in cave 1. Just an amazing, amazing find. 
This is the Isaiah A scroll. Uh, it's an original picture here. It's a prized find. It was dated to 125 BC. That's early 2nd century, and it measures up to 26 feet long. Now, the scroll, by comparison, that you see down here, the Veritas Torah, this is 100 plus feet long, whereas the scroll of Isaiah was only a fraction of that amount, about a quarter of that amount. And then in cave two, you found two fragments of Exodus, one of Leviticus, four fragments of Numbers, two of Deuteronomy, one of Jeremiah, Job, and the Psalms, and then two of Ruth. The finds just keep pouring out of the desert. In fact, you see two fragments here that were discovered in the Dead Sea Scroll area down in the arid desert. In cave three, you had a unique find there, among others, and that is the copper scroll. This is written in Hebrew on copper, and it lists some 60-plus sites of buried treasure, gold ingots, and all kinds of valuables in the Judean desert. Now, the scholars, yes, they did follow the map. They did follow the directions. They didn't find any treasure whatsoever. But ultimately, this was found rolled up as a scroll in copper, and trying to unroll a copper scroll after many thousands of years, you know, it's just going to break apart, shatter. So they had to figure out how to unroll it. So what they did was they x-rayed it for the contents to see what the writing said on the inside first, and then they cut it in strips. And the strips you see at the bottom right-hand corner of the photo there. Uh, so that way we can keep it intact, still without it crumbling as you opened it. Also, K4 was a magnificent finds. That was probably the most productive of all the caves. Some 40,000 fragments were found in this cave of 100 biblical books. It was amazing. The scholars were overjoyed. They took these fragments and tried to compare them with our modern Bibles today, and they found that they were remarkably similar to what we are reading today. The only changes were little slips of the pen by the scribe and different nuances and case endings and so forth, very minor, nothing to do with doctrine or with uh, belief or the text itself or the meaning not coming through. Everything still came through with those wonderful finds here. In fact, the arrow is pointing to an area in the middle of the cave in the floor where there was a rock there, and underneath this rock were thousands of fragments of biblical texts. They removed the rock, they cleared it out, and the rest is history. Just a wonderful find. Then what they found also in cave four, that same cave yielded a document written in Hebrew called the Messianic Testimony. Now the Messianic Testimony was dedicated to compiling verses that referred to the Messiah. They're a collection of verses, and we find on this document verses that portray Christ as king, as prophet, as Messiah and priest, and so forth. And what a great find this was, because they were understanding, the Essenes that was, or the early Jews were thinking that there would be one, two, or even three different messiahs coming to save the people and to cleanse the land. Because prophet, priest, and king never mixed offices. If you remember the Old Testament, you couldn't mix those offices. One king tried to do it. Do you remember his name? Uzziah. Uzziah, chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. Remember, Uzziah died because the Lord struck him down for trying to burn incense in the temple. It was not lawful for him to do. Only the priests. You couldn't mix those two offices. But the document here tells us, and the scriptures that you have in your lap today, tell us that Christ would occupy a threefold office. Prophet, priest, and king. And he was the only one who could do that. Not Uzziah, not anybody else. So what Uzziah could not do in Isaiah chapter 6, Christ could do when he came to save his people. What a wonderful find this is. In cave 11, you found in 1956 a partial copy of Leviticus, an Aramaic targum of Job, and a targum is just a paraphrase of the book itself, and then a partial copy of Psalms, and that's what you see pictured above here. The scholars possess now 40 canonical psalms, ranging from Psalm 90 to 150. Also, two of the three non-biblical temple scrolls 
are the longest, measuring some 28 feet. Notice that's two feet longer than the Isaiah scroll that was found as well. But why do they matter? Let's get right to the point here. This is the crucial moment where you and I can truly appreciate this find in the desert. Why do they matter? Because the question of how accurate the text was copied over 2,000 years or longer is at question. You see, the problem was the Aleppo Codex was our oldest manuscript, and that's right here. This is the Aleppo Codex. This was our oldest manuscript, but notice the date here, 900 AD. That's almost 1,000 years after Christ, 1,000 years. But yet the Old Testament was finished at 400 BC. So the liberal scholars were hammering Christians. They were killing those evangelical books and writing responses to them because they charged us with not having proof that the text was not changed over the course of, you know, some 1,300 years. From the end of the Old Testament, 400 B.C., to 900 A.T. was roughly about 1,300 years. So they're saying, prove to us that your text has not changed from 400 B.C. to your oldest Old Testament manuscript at 900 B.C. What happened in between that time gap? And so in 1947, that all changed with the discovery of hundreds of biblical texts that date into the 2nd century B.C. In fact, just take Isaiah itself. 125 B.C. is only about 275 years removed from the book of Malachi, which ended the Old Testament. So what do these scrolls do for us? It closed the gap, the interval, between the end of the Old Testament with Malachi in 400 B.C., and our first copy of the Old Testament, which was 900 A.D. Now we know exactly what was transmitted and what was written between Malachi and then the early Middle Ages. It's just amazing. And what did they find? They found that 95 plus percent of the Dead Sea Scrolls, the text matches exactly, 95 percent exact copy of this book here, of your Old Testament. Now, you might be asking, well, what about the 5%? You know, (laughs) devil's in the details, right? Well, let me tell you about some of that 5% differences. One is those which the scribe got tired and made a mistake and misspelled a word. Sometimes they got tired and they joined two words together and made a mistake. They should be separated. They should be you know, separate as two words. Then you have those whose eyes skipped from one line they were copying from down to another line they were copying from, and they missed the intervening sentence or phrase or line on the text. Minor things like that due to human material weakness. No change in doctrine, no controversy on 99.9% of everything that's written in the scriptures was originally written by the original authors. Okay, God moved upon those men to write that inspired text. And we know now that the copying process was top-notch. It was exactly... So you can take to the bank and take with confidence that what you're reading today is exactly what was written way back when it was first penned by its author. Have great confidence in that. Now... Notice also, say a bit about the Qumran scribes in this copying process, because the more you know about the scribes, the more confident you're going to be knowing that your text can stand the withering assault of liberal scholarship, no matter what university you go to. Just know that the Bible is the most strongly supported book from ancient history. It's number one. There is nothing from secular history that can rival or surpass The manuscript evidence, the early dates, the amount of manuscripts that have been retained to reproduce this book right here that you hold in your hands. Not Homer's Iliad, even though it's a distant second place. Not Caesar's Wars or Thucydides or any of these other historians from ancient culture. This book is number one. So if you throw out this book, you throw out all of classical literature as being believable or 
uh, being reliable in its transmission. I don't think that's the price the universities are willing to pay at this point. What do you do with all those people and those degrees? I'm paying for a degree, and now you're teaching me maybe, maybe not. I don't think that's going to work. Notice that the scribes at Qumran, we know that there were scribes there. We know that there was a manuscript center there because of what we found on site with Pierre Roland DeVoe. What you're looking at here are benches and tables. So if I go back here, notice the benches they're sitting on. They're all made of stone. They're all uh, tables, like library tables, but all made of stone. They have found these tables in the scriptorium, pictured at the bottom right there, and also inkwells. That looks like a mug to you, probably. Put your coffee in. But it's actually an inkwell. You put ink in there, and you put your quill and so forth, and you start copying and, and start studying and writing. So these were all found there at the ruins in Qumran. It lends support to a manuscript-producing area, copying area. But also, Ishmael in the first century AD, a well-known scribe, describes the work of a scribe this way. He said, My son, be careful in your work, for it is the work of heaven, lest you err either in leaving out or in adding one iota. Remember, an iota is the smallest letter of a Greek language. And thereby caused the destruction of the whole world, especially its understanding of what is coming in the future and what has transpired in the past in the scriptures. Also, there were ten rules that the scribes maintained while they were copying the scriptures, especially the scripture that you see before them. First of all, they had to ritually cleanse and bathe before writing the name of God. Before they came to Yahweh or Adonai or Elohim, they had to be sure that they were bathed and ritually cleansed and had the proper attire on before they wrote down the name. Second, must ignore all conversation of if writing God's name. So if a king walked into the room and a scribe was writing out Yahweh on the text, the scribe should not get up and acknowledge the king. He should finish the word to its perfection and then get up and acknowledge the king. They were radical and they took seriously what they did in this copying process. Thank God for us. We're the benefactors of it today. No copying from memory. Each scribe must have a manuscript physically present to look and to transfer onto a new manuscript they were creating. They couldn't do it from memory. Also, the scrolls must have equal amounts of columns. All the way through, all the way, they had to measure and put a hair's breadth between words and, and letters and so forth. They were meticulous in their counting. The letters and columns are counted on every single panel or manuscript. Also, the parchment or the papyrus must be lined before starting. Every manuscript you see from the Hebrew Old Testament will all have lines on it. Some are very faint because they've worn off but some were scribed with an implement, a wood or a metallic implement to leave a line, much like your lined paper that you have today. Every scroll will have that, without exception. Each column must extend downwards on the manuscript from either 48 lines all the way down to 60 lines. And even this manuscript here, you will see that it lands between 48 and 60 if you count the lines. Also, the scribe must be dressed in full Jewish attire. Old, errant copies of the scripture must be ritually destroyed with care and reverence. And also, they must be aware of the conscious presence of God in the copying process. They believe that God was with them in the copying process. And though sometimes scribes needed glasses and they needed candlelight to do their function, and sometimes it would take years for them to complete you know, a section of scripture, all the time they managed to copy the scriptures accurately for us today. What a blessing that is. So why do they matter for us? Not only do they show the accurate copying process and the transmission through the centuries, but they also show us that archaeology has demonstrated the trustworthiness of the Old Testament text. That that accurately copied text now has a referent into the real world that's called the dirt, the sand, the tells, and all the excavations that are going on in Israel and the Middle East right now. Nothing has been excavated that has contradicted one passage in the scriptures. 
Nothing has. There are some difficulties, but those are not contradictions. They usually can be worked out with simply common sense and with further study. The Old Testament has been transmitted to us from the originals with great care and reverence and fanatic zeal. And thank God he enlisted them to do that because they gave great care and they took their work as very serious. Also, notice that we can have confidence in the trustworthiness, the reliability of the Old Testament that we have now. You can take to the bank that the words of God are fully preserved in the Scriptures. Also, Old Testament prophecy is evidence that the text was divinely inspired. When you look back to the Old Testament, in fact, Isaiah 45 names Cyrus the ruler of the Persians who would set free the captives from Babylon 150 years before his birth. Very specific prophecies go to demonstrate that the word of God had its source in God himself. Only God knows the end from the beginning and knows the future with exact detail. Very different from Nostradamus and the psychic predictors you see today, you know, generalities. Ah, uh, the Kansas City Chiefs will win the Super Bowl. You know, you have a 50-50 chance of being right, right? But try predicting somebody's name, function, and event 150 years before they're ever born. Isaiah 45. So the Old Testament leads us to trust in that prophet, priest, king, Jesus Christ, who would come and save his people. Now, not only is there the Dead Sea Scrolls, you also have the Ketif Hinnom Silver Scrolls. This is only four inches tall in real life. It's on display in the Israeli Museum. It's made of silver, and it was rolled up about the size of a cigarette filter butt. That's about how big it was. And they were panicked on how to unroll this. So they tried to ship it around the world to see if they could do it. Nobody would say, oh, I don't want to touch it. You know, I don't want to destroy this thing. So they figured out a way. They developed a proprietary solution to dip this little scroll in, and they finally unrolled it. They x-rayed it and so forth. Lo and behold, what did they find on the little silver scrolls? Two of them found in Jerusalem in 1980. On the last day of an excavation, two of these were found. They found the priestly benediction of Numbers chapter 6, verses 24 through 26. You remember, it was one of the favorite of Pastor Chuck. May the Lord bless thee and watch over you. May Yahweh make his face to shine upon you and grant you peace. You see, Deuteronomy was also written on this little scroll, and the second scroll had other passages on it. And they used to be worn as amulets around the neck or around the arm, if you were, to take the word of God with you throughout the day. And notice the date here, guys. 600 BC. These are three to 400 years earlier than the Dead Sea Scrolls. This is the oldest scripture we have in the world today. And when you compare it to your modern Bible today, it is exactly the same. Exactly the same. You have the privilege of having an unbroken chain from 600 BC, starting with the Ketif Hinnom Silver Scrolls, all the way through the Dead Sea Scrolls that date as early as the 2nd century B.C., all the way into the early Middle Ages and the late Middle Ages and in, into the 15th, 16th, and 17th century of manuscripts, an unbroken chain of the Word of God. And they all match the text we have today, with the exception of 1, 2, 3, up to 5% of copyist errors. Not Scripture errors, copyist errors. And the meaning of the text fully comes through. But you don't want to ignore the Ketif Hinnom Silver Scrolls. They're an amazing find and a testimony to the care of the scribes. Now, this brings me to the last point as we wrap up here. We brought the scroll in today. The scroll was donated to Veritas International University. And we use it for uh, biblical studies, Hebrew language courses, and bibliology courses. You're more than welcome to come up and analyze it after service. You're more than welcome to touch the edges. This is a scroll that was made to be handled and studied. It's not a ceremonial scroll, so you don't have to worry about you know, desecrating the scroll and so forth. We just ask that you don't touch the font or the writing. But feel free to touch the edges or the top of the rolls and you know, feel it. it's written on calfskin. It's written in ink that they made proprietary for their own use. 
It's in sections and panels. You can see that you come up, the panels are about this long, and they are stitched together, each panel. Usually they would use the stitching of a sinew or a tendon of an animal, a calf or a cow, to stitch them together. Some of those are still present, but others have worn out and been replaced with a sturdy thread. But you'll see that as you go. You're gonna see erasures, you're gonna see patches, you're gonna see panels, and you're gonna see you know, leather and so forth. So isn't that a wonderful thing to have the Lord preserve the scriptures for us today? knowing that you're going to have a spring in your step and the confidence that God has given you Amen. to trust what it says about our Lord Jesus Christ. All the doctrines that you have in this book are only as good as the copying of the text and the preservation of the text we have today. Or else we would not know the voice of God. We would be forever cut off. But in his providential care, he secured his voice through the transmission through millennia. So let's just all stand together. Let's praise the Lord with a final song and thank Him for what He's done with our word today. The gracious Son that He gave us is all preserved in the text, in the testimony. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank You again for preserving Your Scripture, Your Word, Lord. Thank You for the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls and other manuscripts that attest to your faithfulness, your care, your goodness to us. Father, we ask that you would help us to understand and fully appreciate what you've done over the centuries in your people, in the church, and in the Old Testament saints that we read about. Father, you were always there. You always were there with your voice. You never left yourself without a representation, Lord. It was either through your own voice or through angels or through the scripture or through your prophets or whatever it might be. We thank you for that. And we praise you for your word. You said your word endures forever and that you hold your word above your own name. So Lord, let us hold it up high as well. Let us trust in the fully inspired and inerrant word of God. Father, we thank you. Bless us today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.